Welcome everyone, and we're so happy to have you for today's panel discussion. We'll be talking about the trends and opportunities within the events and tourism industries. As Dr. Fu mentioned, I'm Kim Green. I am the Senior Manager for Meetings and Events at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I did graduate from this very program in 2004, so I'm excited to be back here with you all today. And on the stage with me, I have four very amazing panelists. Um, so I will allow each one of them to introduce themselves. If you all will give your name, your role, um, a little bit about how you're connected to the University of Florida, um, and a brief snapshot of your career journey. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with Rick, since you have the microphone down there. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Rick Merriman, I'm Vice President of Consumer Insight for Disney Parks, Experiences, and Products. So you probably know that as well. Disney World, the Disneyland Resort, Disney Cruise Line, Disney Vacation Club, and so on, um, as well as uh, worldwide consumer products, games, and publishing. Um, um, I've been a Gator. I became a Gator. I love that intro with the games, right? When did you first become a Gator? Uh, 1980. Um, interestingly enough, I actually went to school across the street in what, Weill Hall. I'm an engineer by background. Um, and um, I've been in tourism and hospitality working for Disney uh, for over 30 years. And I've done a variety of roles uh, across the business. And my current one is leading the organization that's responsible for deeply understanding what our consumers and our guests, and we can talk about the distinction between those in a minute, but what our consumers and our guests uh, want, what they need, uh, what barriers they face, and so forth to engage with the Disney uh, company. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Doherty. I'm the Tourism Director for the Punta Gorda Inglewood Beach Visitor and Convention Bureau. I'm a proud double gator. Um, I got my undergraduate degree and graduate degree here, both in this uh, College of Health and Human Performance in Exercise and Sports Science. Uh, my first job out of uh, college I got from doing an internship with the Gainesville Sports Commission. Um, and uh, that really kind of got my career kind of kick-started. Uh, from there, I was able to get a job with the Greater New Orleans Sports Foundation, where I had the opportunity to work on uh, quite a few high-profile events, including Super Bowl 36 and men's and women's Final Fours and things like that. So it was a great time in my career to really learn, learn the ropes. Uh, but then I missed the state of Florida so much that I said, you know, I, I left Bourbon Street in the rearview mirror and uh, headed back here about 18 years ago, and uh, it's, it's been a great journey. Uh, good morning. My name is Chip Futch. I'm currently the Director of Business Intelligence and, uh, and Digital Strategy for Aqua Marketing Communications. We, uh, we focus on uh, promoting destinations like Sean's and uh, also handle uh, airports, uh, a economic development, and uh, larger hotels and resorts in the state uh, from a marketing standpoint. But our sweet spot really is in destination marketing, but all across the hospitality sector. Um, former to that, I was... Uh, in, in actually a destination marketing organization as a, uh, as a marketing director. And prior to that, I actually uh, was in the restaurant industry, um, or I spent uh, seven years in another country uh, working to build a restaurant change as the uh, chief marketing officer of that organization. I'm proud to be here and great to see so many people here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Goldman. Um, I am a proud graduate of the University of Florida, class of 78. Uh, majored in advertising with uh, minors in psychology and computer science. Computer science was very different then. You had, <laughs> you had to have a lot of strength to carry the box of computer cards around. Look it up. I don't even think Wikipedia knows about that. Uh, but uh, like many of my um, colleagues, um, went to New York to learn the advertising agency business, uh, did that for uh, many years fell into working with TWA and American Express, and that was where I really fell in love with the travel business, and was later recruited by an advertising agency in Miami, which is my home, and uh, worked there for about 17 years, working my way up through uh, the ranks. I uh, was recruited uh, to Amelia Island Plantation, where I was the chief marketing officer, learned a little more about the resort business and uh, destinations, 
and then was recruited away from there by the St. Augustine, Ponte Vedra, and the Beaches Visitors and Convention Bureau, where I'm now president and CEO. But I'm delighted to be back and share whatever we can um, in terms of information with you. Thanks. Thank you all, um, and we'll get started with today's discussion. So first, I am going to direct uh, this question to both Richard and Sean. What trends have you seen over the last year when it comes to the events being held in your destinations or your venues? Richard, do you want to go first? Okay, sounds great. Um, one of the things that uh, is really different um, since COVID is the rise in small but very special weddings. So we're a leisure-focused destination, as you can imagine, St. Augustine being the anchor of the destination. We do service large groups. It's a wonderful location, lots of capabilities. But during COVID, as you can imagine, a lot of weddings were put off. And so it created this enormous demand coming into 2021 and 2022. But people weren't very comfortable traveling. So brides and mothers of the brides, who, by the way, run the show, write that down. That's important to know. Um, but uh, they um, began to, to conceive of the idea of doing smaller weddings in terms of people, but that would allow them to be more adventurous. Destinations, unique venues, and unique feeding opportunities. So with the same budget, instead of that 250, they do something like 20, 30 folks and do something really exciting. And I know Kim's nodding her head because she's been seeing that in, in her industry as well. So that's one of the things that we see, uh, especially in St. Augustine and Ponte Vedra, is that, that particular change. And we think that that's not gonna change back. Some portion of the wedding industry will stabilize and people will go back to the big weddings. We still have wonderful, wonderful Indian weddings. And if anybody knows what those are, they are as extravagant as you have seen in movies. Um, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful cultural experience. So there will be large weddings. But this new the, um, path uh, is something that I think presents great opportunities uh, for event management folks to highlight the creativity that you have and you bring to the party. And uh, if there's, a, if uh, uh, Sean gives me a minute later, we'll uh, talk about some opportunities to get into that business. Sure, and uh, yes, Indian weddings are huge. Uh, we, uh, one of my hoteliers called me just the other day because uh, you know, we're where Hurricane Ian came across and uh, she was kind of freaking out because she didn't know if the conference center was gonna be back up and running where they were gonna be hosting this huge Indian wedding uh, the third week of November. Turns out they are reopening the conference center uh, November 9th, so just in time. But uh, yeah, she was uh, very, very nervous about that. But I was gonna answer the question more from the, the uh, sports events uh, standpoint, because a lot of the uh, events that we do in our destination are sports related. And one thing we've noticed over the last couple of years or few years is that uh, more sports organizers are looking and willing to go off the beaten path in terms of where they take their sporting events. Uh, it used to be a lot harder to compete with some of the bigger destinations, uh, but now they are willing to try out uh, smaller destinations because they realize it's, it's really about the event itself and who can give them what they need most to make their event successful. So as long as you have the, the, the venue, a good venue, uh, a good, uh, good hotels and things of that nature, they're willing, <coughs> excuse me, they're willing to try uh, places that they haven't been before. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'd say that has, uh, I've noticed also as a trend is those event organizers are becoming more educated in terms of what, what the destination needs from the event. Um, <clears throat> so instead of them coming to us and just trying to get something from us without understanding what they need to give back to the, uh, the community, um, they're more in tune with no understanding that the economic impact, the room nights, the media exposure, all that's very important to us um, in, in order for us to invest in, in, in your event. Um, so, so yeah, education's become uh, very important along those lines. And then also I'd say uh, a, lot, a lot of event organizers are, are more willing and um, are desiring even uh, to do multi-year uh, agreements, which really benefits, I think, both parties involved. 
and Sean, I think you have a really exciting destination that's coming on, or a new venue that's coming online um, very shortly, which I think you mentioned will change kind of the scope of the meetings and events that you'll be able to host. Exactly. So like I said, most of the events we do right now are sports related. Uh, we, uh, Allegiant Airlines came into our destination back in 2012, I think it was, uh, and started with just three flights that came into the destination. Now they're up to uh, 51 destinations that fly in, and they just uh, invested even further in our destination by building a resort. They're in the process of building a huge resort that's going to have about 785 rooms, 60,000 square feet of event meeting space, 20 food and beverage concepts, uh, full service spa, golf course, all, all, the, all the, nine, the full nine yards. So it's really going to open things up for us and is a huge game changer for us to go after the the convention market that we could never go after before. Awesome. Now, just switching gears a little bit to um, beyond your destinations, we need to figure out a way of how to get people there, right? So Chip, I'm going to direct this question to you. In terms of destination marketing, what has changed over the last few years and what are you really focusing on um, in terms of opportunities for your clients? Well, it's that, you know, obviously 2020 was a, a changer as far as trend lines go. Uh, Florida was on the up and up. Um, 2020 changed a lot of things everywhere. However, Florida saw a good side of that. So maybe I'll hit this from, from, from three points uh, from an agency standpoint. Uh, first, if we look at operationally, internally in an agency, what have we seen change? Um, obviously, data has always played a big part of what we do, how it drives decision making and also allows uh, us to prove return on investment for our clients. Uh, that's only increased, but what I've really seen, it, it feels like in the last year um, that it was always very important to clients, destinations, to see the data, but now it feels like they really embrace it more, more than just the typical top-line metrics. For a destination uh, in Florida, uh, most of the way they're funded is through a tourism de development tax that's applied on top of hotel rooms that are stay, uh, for stays under six months. Um, so that was really one of their key performance indicators. But now they're really looking more at deeper data as, 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 uh, as, as, as uh, computational power gets stronger and platforms get stronger to be able to look at that data. We're starting to see them uh, really embrace more about behavior and, and how they stay in the destination uh, without getting too far out. So we're seeing a, a more adoption of that. Um, from a leisure travel standpoint, uh, Influencer marketing isn't anything new. Social media marketing isn't anything new. But what seems to me, this is somewhat anecdotal because it's just between, the, the, it's, it's mostly between the clients that we service, but I imagine it's, it's more industry-wide. We've seen that stabilize in terms of a business opportunity. Before it was somewhat more nebulous. Um, you would look at uh, an influencer who had, let's say, 100,000 followers and then an influencer that had a million followers or some of these behemoths that, you know, 50, 60 million. And they would come up with a number of what it would cost you to use them as an influencer for your brand, whether that be a destination or a product outside of the, the hospitality industry, et cetera. But now it seems to have stabilized where there's more of a business model around it where it's more tangible. There's a cost per mill like there is in digital advertising. So we know what it costs per thousand impressions. It's kind of an interesting thing. We're starting to see that happen. Um, from a B2B standpoint, business to business for events and whatnot, what we're seeing, and this is, probably really good news. Um, I'll touch on that in a second, but we're, we're seeing, and, and Kim and I talked about this last night even, we're not seeing a slowdown at all. In fact, we're, we're seeing more and more demand from our clients for assets and uh, trade show materials, et cetera, because they're going to more and more. And that's both, both from the point of when we go to industry events, we're seeing more of those, and as well as our clients bringing in uh, events to their destinations. They're just it's up to the point where they're going, well, we're, we're where we were in 2019. We're in good shape. So uh, that's really exciting to see. And this is somewhat, again, hate to use the word twice. Sean and I used to have a little internal joke that you could only use air quotes twice, a, once a day. So <laughs> I'm going to use anecdotal again. So uh, saying it's somewhat anecdotal again. But uh, in the past, historically, when business travel started to taper off, that was a bad economic sign. It was like a, a, the tremor before a quake. We're not seeing that at all. And that's really, that, that kind of gives me hope. Um, and because everyone wants to talk about the R word, the recession word, we're, we're not seeing a slowdown in business at all. So. 
Thanks, Chip. Um, and Richard, you mentioned a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of trends with events and more of that personalization of your experiences. Um, and then Chip, you know, you, you talked a little bit more about the data that you're using to inform decisions. So Rick, I want to direct this question over to you. Um, how are you utilizing AI and data science to really improve that overall guest experience? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating and emerging um, field to see the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you hear AI, ML, um, there's a lot of debates where that line is drawn. But, but that set of technology, I mentioned earlier, we, we think of our market in two ways. There are consumers, and we use that term to mean uh, people at home, right, that we are trying to attract and engage in our brand. And then guests, and that's basically our word for customers. So those are people who have engaged. They're visiting, they're purchasing, that kind of a thing. So on the consumer side, um, the, the use of AI is very advanced in areas of revenue management, yield management. Some of you may be familiar with that um, you know, field of study, which really is, you know, I think all of us share one thing in this industry. We're working with a finite capacity. You know, we have a fixed capacity. But demand is variable. So you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms can really help organizations optimize uh, the yield of that capacity uh, through pricing and promotions and, and so forth. Um, so that, that's, you know, the airlines pioneered that. Hotels have been doing it for years. Um, it's now moving into other um, areas of, of the experience. So um, for example, um, visiting our theme parks. This was one of those. Uh, COVID-related uh, developments. Uh, one of our board members actually, you know, shared the, the concept of never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and, you know, COVID prompted us to rethink things. And one of them is we now require reservations to visit our theme parks. Um, and so that pre presents an opportunity, much like a hotel or an airline, to manage that daily capacity or that daily demand and with that, there's all sorts of opportunities about optimizing the experience. So those are some of the examples. Um, some of the more emerging uh, technology that's out there is moving very quickly. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, if you wanted to purchase or plan, you had to call. And then, you know, we came up with websites and you could go online and, you know, now there's apps, of course. But now with, with AI, ML enabled technology and, and text recognition and voice recognition, um, there's some fascinating applications with what's known as chatbots, where it, you believe, you know, it's the experience is if you're chatting online with a person, but it's actually an AI-driven uh, application behind the scenes. And, and that's moving into all kinds of areas. One, I'd leave you with one thing to go uh, web search uh, when you get a chance. Uh, web search doll E, it's D-A-L-L dash E. Kind of like Wally, -E, the movie, you might remember Wally, -E, but it's Dolly. -E. Um, it's an open, you know, open source AI application, and you can type in a sentence in real time. It will create imagery uh, based on your what you type in, real time. It's not searching the internet and trying to find an image. It's creating that image real time. The technology is just to do that into video. You can literally write a paragraph, a story, and it can create a, a, a video. Um, music, you can you know now describe a song and you can have a song composed. So on the creative side of the business, it's just moving very quickly where the technology is going. So those are just some of the, the ways that we look at artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in our business. And Chip, do you have anything to add there? Well, actually, just to add on top of what uh, Rick was talking about right there for, for imagery and video, just as a, a touch point, uh, we just completed a shoot for one of our clients, a very large uh, video shoot. And time is money when you're on shoots. And we ran into a rain delay one morning, had to roll anyway, had too many talent there. The sky wasn't beautiful. It had dried up and everything. But we got back into post-production. Maybe that's not usable. Well, it, motion tracking is not a new trick. But neural assisted motion tracking to the point where we can track objects into a three-dimensional scene, we were ever to replace a sky that it, it wasn't, it would not have been possible without machine assisted things. So it completely saved the day by being able to use machine, uh, machine, uh, a neural based system. 
the other place we use it is when we're doing research. Uh, when we're doing qualitative research, a lot of times we'll want just a simple one word response. Well, when you're trying to aggregate, if you get lucky and get like a 10,000 person sample or something larger, it can take a long time because people will mistype things, et cetera. Using natural language parser AIs uh, to go in and aggregate thoughts and develop sentiment has is, is been a massive game changer for us in terms of time. And how do you expect AI and data science to change your business strategy and operations over the next five years? Um, yeah, I alluded to a little bit. Um, we, we've got a long history at the Disney Company of being the creator, right? We're, we create the, the content and we present that to the guests. Um, where AI is going for the applications I mentioned, the one you can look up, is just kind of a sample of it. Uh, more and more we're seeing the consumer wants to be part of that process and we, we call it co-create. Um, and so for us, it's a, it's a big cultural change to move away from, you know, here are these really creative types behind the curtain and they work for a year and the curtain goes up and everybody oohs and ahs and loves it versus like, let's bring the consumer and the guests into the process and let them co-create their own experience. And it's really, it's, we see it as the next phase of personalization, which we talked a little bit about. Um, you know, the days of, of everyone wanting to experience kind of the, the same track of experience are long gone. Uh, every customer, every consumer, every guest is looking for some unique aspect of, the, of that experience. And so we believe AI and ML tools can can provide that in a cost-effective way, right? We'd love to all do it, you know, in a personalized, true personal way, but it would be cost prohibitive, uh, but AI ML can do that. We have an app right now, if you visit Walt Disney World, called Genie. And Genie, among other things, you express your uh, interest and in what you, you know, kind of what you're looking to do for the day, and it will create you a personalized itinerary. And it's capitalizing on, you know, back of house data, it knows what's available and you know, where it's likely to be crowded and what time of day and so forth. And it will create an actual itinerary for you rather than kind of you know, having the guests have to figure it out themselves. So that's, that's another one you, could, you can download the app. You can play with it without going to the park. A genie, as in a Latin. <laughs> and Rick, with that too, um, does that help your company to kind of direct where traffic is gonna be and and help with making sure that things aren't getting overcrowded and that sort of thing as well? Right, I mean, you know, the talk about data, with, with every piece of data comes an opportunity to not only improve the experience for the guests, but to drive, you know, business objectives. So, it, exactly, we can uh, smooth out that demand by, you know, enticing or offering up things that we know, you know, might be less demanded in the morning or less demanded at the night. Um, you know, same with restaurant availability. Uh, and so forth. So it, it all, it ultimately all comes back to, you know, we're selling this or offering this finite capacity. And I always like to say, you know, one thing I'd leave you with is um, if you're in the tourism, hospitality, event management business, um, it's like selling fresh produce. Does anybody get the analogy? Fresh produce, if I don't sell it today, it's, it's bad and I can't sell it tomorrow. Well, that's true with everything we do. That room, if it goes empty last night, I can't put it on half off tonight and sell it again. So there's just a lot of value in maximizing the yield you're getting from your, your capacity and the demand that you've got. Um, because once, once it's gone, it's, you know, there's no way to reclaim it like you might in retail, you know, have a half off sale the next day or something like that. So. And then switching gears, I wanna talk a little bit about another trend um, that I've seen in particular um, within the tourism and events industry, which is sustainable travel. Um, we've seen a renewed focus on sustainable travel, um, really minimizing the impact that you have on the local cultural environment and taking a more eco-friendly approach to the physical environment. Um, and I know, uh, Richard, in particular, you have a very historic destination, so I imagine that you're seeing this a bit more, but what, are, what is your destination doing to promote more of that sustainable and responsible travel and tourism? Thanks for that question, Kim. Um, we have a couple of unique uh, concerns because um, we have authentic historical sites um, that can be degraded by overuse, um, it's important to manage uh, the uh, size of groups and what they're able to do there. Um, 
But we've also found that there is a growing demand for sustainable uh, behaviors. Um, Kim may have heard of, uh, it's a new organization, CENFEC, uh, Sustainable Events Network uh, for Florida and Caribbean. So this uh, came about because driven by the group industry. Um, we had meeting planners uh, calling us and asking us, what are you doing? What can you do for our event? And, uh, you know, we looked around. It was a brand new concept um, just a few years ago. And so we looked at what was possible. Um, there's been a number of uh, legislative uh, actions that protect organizations for everything from food rescue uh, to um, the use of uh, multiple use products, uh, eliminating single use products wherever possible. Um, I recently stayed uh, in a hotel where instead of having uh, single use water bottles, um, they had a lovely reusable, and it's still, I still carry it around in my car, water bottle, um, which could be filled from a filtered site. Um, in the in the hotel, um, and, and they offered that in the rooms. Those things are things that consumers are demanding. And when, uh, in particular, our our meeting planners started asking questions, we have a number of smaller products. So I'm going to switch gears and kind of give you the um, tracks, uh, the uh, tires on the road kind of thing. Um, you can't. Um, have mom and pop organizations switch overnight. Um, the power of Disney, Universal, large organizations to make a decision about sustainability and, and uh, initiate from the ground up a policy is wonderful. But in, in our world, in uh, the worlds of, that uh, Sean and I live in and, and that uh, Chip assists with, um, you really have to do things staged and you have to work within people's capabilities. So this particular organization offers uh, a path to connect uh, environmentally conscious and um, also social conscious organizations who can, in the example of food rescue, you know you've got a meeting, you always over order food, there's something available, you let um, this organization know in advance, and they connect you with people who will come and rescue that food, or, or um, uh, th the kinds of things that you would use to entertain people at um, a meeting. Um, That's definitely a great resource um, to make everyone aware of, um, and interesting to hear what you're doing in your destination. Now, I know, Sean, you and I talked a little bit about um, this particular piece, but I know you have a very unique position within your organization that actually um, helps with some of this sustainable, responsible travel. Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Sure. So um, our destination uh, is surrounded by water. Uh, we have the second largest estuary in the state, Charlotte Harbor. Uh, we've got the beaches, so the gulfs right there. Um, a few years ago, the county commission got together during their strategic planning, and one of the main focal points that they were going to look at improving uh, throughout the county was our water quality. Uh, they understood it from a residential standpoint, that's important to have clean drinking water and that kind of thing, but also uh, from the tourism standpoint as well. So they actually hired a, a person who, he's our water quality manager, and that's what he focuses on every day of the week, uh, is monitoring and helping provide solutions to any water quality type issues, whether it's uh, red tide mitigation or um, septic, septic to sewer uh, conversions, th things of that nature. Um, so the, the quality of our water, I mean, really what we sell our destination on, a lot of it, it does surround our, our uh, uh, water, uh, whether it's fishing, you know, our area is uh, uh, known as the tarpon fishing capital of the world. Uh, we've got some great kayaking, paddle boarding, um, uh, snorkeling, uh, and, and our beaches. So really a lot of what we're selling our destination on is that outdoor adventure type recreational type thing that, you know, water is usually a part of it. So if the water quality goes downhill, so does tourism, and tourism is the biggest industry in our county. So, so that's something that we've really uh, made a, a strong effort in making sure that we can 
uh, you know, improve and maintain the quality of our water throughout the county. And Rick, can you tell us a little bit about what Disney's doing um, in terms of sustainability as well? Sure. Um, you know, certainly some of the things Richard mentioned, you know, the elimination of single-use products, um, example would be in the hotel rooms, um, rather than have individual bottles of shampoo, have the dispensers, uh, which, you know, aren't always the, you know, people like those little bottles, but, I, you know, the guests have adjusted. Um, but probably the most notable one recently is we launched um, our fifth cruise ship, the Disney Wish. I don't know if anyone heard. It sails out of uh, Port Canaveral. Um, and it's one of the first cruise ships uh, in the world to be powered by liquid natural gas. So you may hear LNG. Um, and, and that, you know, represents a, a lower carbon footprint as it, you know, sails the waters of the world. Um, but it, it's interesting, getting, getting the ship built and powered on LNG, you know, was, was a mammoth effort itself. But when you think about all the places a cruise ship goes and may go in its 30, 40 year life, um, you've got to make sure they have LNG when you get there. So it's working with all the ports that we visit and so forth to assure there'd be availability of this liquid natural gas because, um, you know, you don't want to get to a point where this ship can only sail to one or two places, right? We want to have that flexibility. But, um, and that's just one example. Uh, we've got a, uh, a new private destination in the Bahamas as our cruise line grows. Uh, we currently have a, a private island. We, we've uh, announced a second destination and working with the Bahamian government to assure that what we do there, you know, similarly, it's all about the beaches and the coral and, and, and the wildlife and so forth. And that's very important to the, to the residents of the Bahamas and the leaders. Um, so we are working hand in hand with them to create a destination that won't just be for those that cruise with Disney, but will have um, elements that will be available to the, to the residents of the Bahamas. Uh, and so we're working with them on that. So those are just one of the, couple of the examples of the Disney cruise industry or Disney cruise line that, that we're focused on. Great, thank you. I have one last question um, for all of you before I have one last question for all of you before we open it up for, for questions from our audience. Um, but what do you all see for the future of the events and tourism industry? Anyone could jump in. <laughs> all right, I'll go ahead. Um, well, just briefly, I would say that, like Chip alluded to earlier, it's not slowing down. Um, I think uh, um, one thing I think that really came out of COVID is that people realized how important travel and vacations are to them. That's not something that they want to give up, and it's really kind of more of a, a need than a want. Um, it's not a luxury anymore. People feel the need to get away, to, to just uh, unwind, to recharge, to refresh, and to have a change of scenery. And uh, luckily for us in Punta Gorda Beach, we've got some great scenery. So uh, if you need a change of scenery, just come, come see us. But, uh, but that's why I think. I think it's really, you know, it's not going anywhere. It's only going to grow. I'll jump in um, real quick here. Uh, yeah, just to reinforce that, travel isn't gonna be stopped. That was proven. The second people were able to travel, they found where they could and they did. Outdoor travel has exploded. National parks are busting at the seams. Uh, people, are, people can't get enough of that. Uh, it just travel cannot be stopped no matter how far they go. And the other thing that you really see a trend of is, is destinations being more honest with who they are in a very divisive world politically. That's as far as I'm going to go with politics. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's important for destinations to say who they are, what they represent, and what their values are. And uh, we're seeing that more and more. That's, I see that not continuing to slow down either. So I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the travel industry in the many years that I've been associated with it is the intended or expected demise of uh, third-party assistance, travel agents. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that uh, meeting planners and third-party planners, uh, event planners, are going to be in a growth mode. The complexity of uh, doing events and the imagination that our customers have is going to drive them to find people who know what they're talking about, can sh shorten their time uh, for research and get them the kind of experience that they're really looking for. So, in spite of what the pundits tell us, 
cyclical, cyclically over the over my career certainly, is the third party planner is not dead. There's a great future for them, and uh, so uh, remember where you heard that. Yeah, in our case, um, I'm very fortunate on my team. I have a group that's dedicated to what we call consumer foresight. So I said I lead consumer insight, which is more about what's happening now. This group looks five, 10 years out on a, on a constant basis. And one of the things we see is consumers desire simplicity. And Richard's exactly right. If an app can provide that, great, but an app can only do so much. The third party travel agents, you know, online wholesalers, et cetera, they're, they're booming because it's a complex world and consumers want it to be simpler. Um, we see a trend toward value. And when we, you know, I think there's always been a desire to get value for your money, but now we hear consumers talking more about value for my time. So I mentioned, you know, we sell fresh produce. Consumers, they know they can't return that vacation that goes poorly, right? That one week a year with the family, it, you know, that's our shot. You know, it's, it's a big expense, but it's the time getting the, the stars to line up. So if you can assure that you're providing value for the time they're, they're committing, uh, that's another trend we see. And then finally is wellness. Um, and we use that term, we, we see it being thought of by consumers much more broadly than the traditional physical wellness. It's mental health, it's emotional health, spiritual enlightenment, those types of things. We see consumers associating those needs with travel often. And you know, there's a lot of examples out there in the marketplace. And all of it is turbocharged by technology. You know, it, every aspect of travel is being turbocharged by technology. And we've coined a term, you know, at Disney, we like to make up words like Imagineer, you know, is a combination of two words. Our latest is fidgetal, and it's easier if you see it. It's P-H-Y-G-I-T-A-L. And we believe the future is this seamless blending of the physical with the digital. We're not, we're not all in on the future as the metaverse. Right? And we're all gonna sit in our living rooms and put goggles on and never have to go anywhere. Um, I know there's at least one large company that thinks that might be the future and they've changed their name accordingly. But, <laughs> but we, also we also recognize that just delivering a physical experience is, is also a bit dated. We've gotta figure out how to bring those two together. And we continue to see people want, to, as you've heard here, people wanna gather with other people. That I think it's an innate human desire. You know, I come up for every home football game. I could watch those games on TV and get a much better view. You know, the, the cold uh, beverage would be a lot closer. You know, I wouldn't have to stand in line. I wouldn't have to park across campus. But, but I like being with my tribe, right? My tribe is Gator Nation. People want to be with their tribe. And everyone's got a different tribe, uh, but they want to be together. And we don't see that being solely delivered via digital applications. I love that term, Rick, digital. I'm definitely going to use that um, in the future. But from my perspective, I will say that I agree to. Um, right now, there's more of a desire to have those connections and to meet face to face and in person um, with people than ever before. Just in my business in, in general, um, back in 2019, um, my team managed about 60 or so events per year, and that's actually increased to almost 100 events um, for 2022. So we're really seeing the need um, and the desire for people not only to have those in-person experiences, but also still continue to have those virtual events and things like that as well. So I will say from an events perspective, the, the virtual piece is not going away. So it's definitely a good complement um, to have both skill sets in terms of in-person and virtual events. But the demand is definitely there. And people are, like you said, Rick, looking to make those connections and have those experiences together. Um, so I will open it up to questions for anyone in our audience. Um, does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask our panelists?
Wow, that's a really good question. And I'm going to jump in just because I kind of lived that. Um, on the event management and the tourism side, the important thing is to get your feet wet, to get into a place. If you can get to an organization that has the structure to provide um, teaching and mentoring, uh, do that. Uh, but there are plenty of opportunities, especially in the event side, organizations that exist out there who perform those services expect to work very hard, expect the hours to be difficult, expect to miss your family on holidays. But if you can make it through that and you'll get a sense for whether you want to care for people, because that's what our business is all about. It's caring for people. And if you decide that that's something that inspires you, then you've got a magic future. You'll be in the right place, you'll have the experiences, and step on the right stones as you move forward. There really aren't a lot of mistakes that you can make, in my opinion. Everything that you learn along the way that tells you, I want to do more of that, or no way, I'm done with that. That's a step that saves you time and, and your career path. Uh, so. Um, if the opportunity presents itself, you know, jump in uh, to a Disney. Um, if the opportunity doesn't present itself and there's an event organization, Corporate One Events for One uh, in, in Northeast Florida, dive in there. They always have positions, especially on the event management and the tourism side. There are always positions available. Jump in and learn as much as you can from those opportunities. You'll know when it's time to move on if you've got that entrepreneurial bug, people will start calling you. You'll be recommended personally for the skill sets that you have. That's when you know, okay, I got leverage, a power, and now I can start looking at maybe opening my own company, maybe becoming a partner in a company. And so those are, those are things that I would encourage you uh, to look at. You have a career ahead of you. There are, there are really no mistakes. Uh, so either path that you take, there's a, a bright future for you. I'll kind of add to that just from my experience. So I was involved in the sales side of uh, sports marketing. So one thing I realized was when I was in New Orleans, um, you know, I got some great experience and all, but it was easier to sell New Orleans. Everybody wanted to go to New Orleans. They knew what New Orleans was about. Uh, it was a fun place to be and all that. And so a lot of my job really centered more about when can I fit these people in? When, when can they get the hotel rate they need? When is there not a citywide convention going on? Things of that nature. So it was really more just trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together. And then when I moved to Punta Gorda Inglewood Beach, it was a lot harder. You know, you're having to educate people and sell people on the destination. And I didn't have to do any of that really uh, in New Orleans. So, so that's just something to, to keep in mind as well. You know, I just want to echo what Richard said. If you can get into Disney, we'd love to have you. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, my question is mainly for Rick. I was just wondering, as Disney as like kind of an entertainment and, uh, I guess, experience company, I was wondering why Disney hasn't invested more in like the video game industry or say the metaverse as like the younger generations even more so than us are definitely valuing more of that like immersive virtual experience stay tuned can i just say that no um <laughs> yeah um it, it's a great question and it's something that we have wrestled with for many years um we do have an organization uh disney gaming um at one point we believed we could develop games, license, you know, uh, and distribute games. Um, uh, Kingdom Hearts, I think, maybe, anybody? Kingdom Hearts, yeah, is that? Um, see, very, not, not quite the recognition we'd like. Um, we've moved more to a, currently, a licensed model. So we'll, we, you know, ultimately, um, one thing that makes the Disney brand so powerful is all of our characters and franchises. And I think, at least at this point, we've recognized we're not going to be able to go and you know develop games as expertly as Activision and EA and so forth. So instead, we've gone to more of a licensing model where we will license our brands, our characters, our franchises into the gaming uh, world. But to, to your point, we're you know I'll just I know this is on video or what have you, but 
uh, we see a lot of opportunity there. And we recognize uh, that foresight group I mentioned just last week, we shared a deep dive on Gen Z, which I think is probably most people in this room. Um, and it's, it's painfully evident, some of our competitors, it's no secret, are, are moving into more gaming inspired IP, you know, intellectual property. We've traditionally gone with more movie based IP. If you walk around a Disney park, you'll see a lot of movies being brought to life, and in some cases, TV shows and what have you, but you don't see, to your point, um, the, the, the actual video game inspired IP. So I would say stay tuned. You know, we've made some announcements, but I'm, I'm not able to get into a lot of detail, uh, but more to come. I think we have time for one last question, if anyone has any other questions. No, well, I am going to do a quick round robin with you all um, as we wrap up. Is there one piece of advice that you would give to all of the current students out here? What do they need to know now? Um, what can they do to increase their, increase their chances of being hired post-graduation? We'll just do a quick round robin. If you had that one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I'd say um, do homework set up interviews but do homework on who it is you're talking to they want to hear that you've invested something in the process that will lead to something else and the best interviews are the ones where the interviewer does most of the talking um i completely echo what richard said uh and it's something we've said in other other times we've come around the students before network um, I know it's hard when you're going to get your first job. Well, you're a Gator, you're gonna get a job. Don't worry about that. Uh, network though, network, go outside your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to call. Uh, you mentioned wanting to work, uh, the, the, the woman in the back mentioned wanting to work for, you know, maybe in the destination. Don't be afraid to call one. If you know you want to work, call them. Say, do you have any internships open? Do you, do you have any positions open? They might not, but they might find one. I've seen that before. But network, network, network. And that's hard for me to say because I'm an introvert. I don't like talking in front of people or people in general so yeah <laughs> yeah he kind of stole some of mine um but one other thing i would uh point out doing is uh look into some of the industry conferences a lot of them will offer a special student rate so it's not going to cost you a whole lot of money to go to uh one of the industry conferences and that's a great opportunity to both network as well as become even more educated on what's going on in this in the industry right now um, what I would share is um, develop your own personal brand. Think about what makes you different and unique in the marketplace, and you all have it. We, we like to refer to it because, you know, Marvel is part of the Disney uh, uh, company. Figure out what your superpower is. I know you all have one, and make sure that you brand yourself and feature that in every opportunity you get, whether it's networking or interviewing or whatever it might be, you know, on your resume. Just have that the thing that people immediately, a brand is something that brings an association without conscious thought. You want your name to bring that association, whether it's analytics or, you know, a, a superior operator, attention to detail, whatever that superpower you have is, uh, identify it and brand yourself with it and, and just be relentless about going back to that. Don't, don't try to be everything to everybody. Figure out what your brand is. Thank you everyone for your time today. This concludes our discussion. We hope you gained some really valuable insights into the events and tourism industries and we will all be around here um, later today if you have any other follow-up questions. Thank you so much.